Uh, uh, yeah, if I record this, it's going to record to both of our accounts. Oh, okay. Uh, that's not that's problem that. Yeah, cool. I don't think it's sort of six and two threes as long as it's sort of uh, safety in numbers. At least one of yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cheers. What are you drinking tonight? Heatherwood. Heatherwood. Mm, gold ale. Nice. We've just been past where the spoon's in concert and you should see them all sitting outside. Yeah. I can imagine. It's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I didn't join the ones at midnight, kind of uh, Sunday morning, sort of Monday morning, but uh, the thought crossed my mind. Dedication to the drink there. We've got a table booked at a local pub for Friday afternoon. Um, hopefully by then, all the people that are wanting to go out there and take it a bit too far and whatnot would have had the fun. <laughs> yes. It's Christmas. Similar. It's kind of, I don't know, it's sort of, I don't know whether I, the booking thing just is. Uh, yeah, I, I get it. I understand it and sort of, but it's just, it's not spontaneous, is it? It's not like, right, right. Yeah, that's sometimes the fun, isn't it? You walk past a pub and you think, right, I'll pop in for a pint or a bit of food and but now it's too. Yeah, especially if you see a nice evening or whatever, you just think, oh, yeah, let's do it. But whatever at the moment, I'll take the little, take, take the little steps as, uh, as we can get them right now. It's, um, yeah, I really hope it uh, all goes in the good direction and not the bad direction. Um, guys, I've, I've muted everybody on entry, but if you want to unmute yourself and chat, feel free to join in. As to where sometimes people that haven't used Zoom before forget to mute themselves and they've got the TV on in the background, the telephone. So maybe it's noticed. Yeah, if you want to chat. I was doing a great a couple of months ago. I was talking to the sort of uh, university or third age. <laughs> Uh, the mother and daughter having a right old ding dong in the background, completely <laughs> unaware that, that kind of thing was, they were muted. <laughs> I had a deal at a work meeting, someone answered the phone call and was just chatting away. Da, da, da. Thankfully, nothing too confidential, <laughs> but it's answered the phone call and just, yeah, brazenly mm. chatted away on, on Zoom. <laughs> hey, uh, at least it works. It's uh... <laughs> It's been a bit of a lifesaver, although I can't decide whether I, once this is all over, whether we'll ever want to see it again or whether it will just get integrated into our lives. Um, yeah, I think I'll hang around with its uses. But um, it can never take away and it can never be the same as sitting down in the same room as a person. It's um, really, really a not. Um, like, yeah, there's just... I don't know, sort of like the BBK sort of uh, ADM and things like that. I mean, my wife uh, sort of our representative on that. And she sort of says, yeah, but you just don't have the touchy feely kind of sitting next to somebody sort of in the in the audience and going, oh, well, that idiot, please shut up. <laughs> sort of three people around you go, oh, yeah, you've been droning on for ages. What a load of old talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't get that kind of. <laughs> Mind you, I love some of, I think people have got better at kind of, and I'd, I'd like it less of, of kind of, um, of, of turning their video off. But, uh, sort of a few months ago, it was fun, sort of in the, as, as the evening got on, and depending on the speaker, watching who dozed off or not, yeah. <laughs> resting their eyes in, in front of the screen. It is sometimes useful to, to say, I don't know. Ian, can you see the waiting room? Um, I'm not pressure. Oh yes, I can. And yes, got it. Are you able to admit? Yeah, Just if we both worry. share that when I start no, no, to waffle off. Um, yes. No, it normally pings up on my screen, but that's when I'm used to. Uh, yeah. Um, having it in house and it's not pinging on me, so I missed it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Ah, uh, hey Shirley, hey Linda, hi Polly. Hi, uh, yeah, Dougie. Thanks for joining. In. All the yeah. way from Body Scotland. <laughs> how you doing? I'm really good, thanks. Yeah, really good. Missing you all. How are you? Good. You're in a white room in a, a padded cell. I'm not in prison. <laughs> 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 this is the um, the annex of a house, what I now call the Manex. It's like a little side bit of the house that I can have to myself. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me. Um, yeah, <laughs> reminds he's prison. <laughs> yeah. And you're on the beer as well. Oh, I put a neck coil. Help us gas, gas on. <laughs> you do. How, how long is it, Dougie? I forgot to ask. Is it is it an hour or an hour and a half or what? What you? I aim for 
I've aimed for around an hour. Um, right. My corner's a bit longer. Um, okay. But if you need, obviously anyone needs to cut out at any time, to do so. Um, I'll, I'm going to record it and put it on YouTube. So if you want to watch the end, you can watch the end. But I could probably okay. sit here and talk for a good five hours or something, just chatting <laughs> on about bees. So I've tried to keep it to around an hour. Yeah. yeah. Be best. <laughs> Try my best. Yeah. You want me to mute me? No, I feel free to sit and chat on if you like to, like. Um, yeah. I, yeah. How many, how many are you expecting? What do you know? I don't know. Um, I think between maybe 10 and 20. Um, I really don't know. We've also invited Hexham Beekeepers Association. So maybe some members of that. Um, and some people that are part of a course at Kirkley Hall, I think, has been invited. Um, oh, and I've invited some other beekeepers that I know of or people that are interested in beekeeping to see if they wanted to come along. I'm going to be talking 30 to 40, I would I would take a guess that is uh, uh, special. Yeah. Mm. Good stuff. Hello, Rachel and Neil. Lovely to have you here. On my computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we hope to get back to meeting at our new home in, um, in July. Um, that's the aim at the moment, unless things go seriously south. Um, I can't remember the date in July, but I'll just, uh, what's the second Tuesday in July? It should be the 13th of July with a following wind. And it'd be good to, uh, it'd be good to start again there, uh, but let's take everything one step at a time. I think June, the sort of, we could technically, I think do it in June, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a great idea, so. Um, but yeah, I think maybe turn it slowly because there might be some like apprehension of even people going out to community events and whatnot. So giving that a bit more, giving everyone a bit more time to become comfortable with social situations again is probably I wise. I, think I am really excited before. to check out the new home, home like, but, um, but still, it's probably wise to take it slowly. Hopefully, we can get back into the apiary and sort of doing sort of uh, practical in uh, sessions in in sort of from May the seventeenth onwards. That's certainly the plan at the moment. Um, yeah, um, but just yeah, as you say, step by step, and do it when people are comfortable. It's sort of uh, there's no point rushing it for a few weeks after this long. Uh, but yes, it will be. Uh, it will be nice to do. Have you seen the hives outside of ours, Doggy? The the two outside the caravan. Yeah, I've talked to Alan about them, and he said yeah. they've been vacant for a few years. So I keep on saying that I'll come up and put some bees in them. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I don't That'd think I've ever noticed them, like, with bees in. in them. No, I yeah. think these were new ones, and I, I don't think, I think the old ones did have, but I think you'd, you've got some new ones. And since then, I think it was a local guy, um, mm. Sandy, I think he, he was supposed to. Be coming up and putting some in but maybe that was just around the time of covid maybe yeah i think just nothing happened last year nice place for them obviously on the they're, edge they're of just the been waiting for you and... that's what's happened they're just been waiting <laughs> <laughs> they're waiting next for geordie come... bees next time i'll come up i'll bring some bees with us yeah. <laughs> on geordie yeah. bees in dundee <laughs> <laughs> you thought hackett no i don't see if i'd if i were to put some bees up there i would look to source some Based on the local local keeper to be a bit more adjusted because yeah. it is it is that bit colder up there, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Do they have to be? Yeah. Do they kind of get you acclimatized to a certain area? Ah, uh, it's a it's a good debate that one. And a good discussion. Oh, <laughs> okay. Local. Okay. I think so. From all the research that I've had put towards this and the conversations I've put towards this, you now I do believe that your bees are gonna. And the genetics can be passed down to be able to bear and deal with the, not just the extreme changes in temperature, but maybe even the, when the start of the season is and when the end of the season is. Um, yeah, because we're a good few weeks behind you at the, at the moment. I think we know it's when we go down Newcastle, all the buds are kind of coming out on the trees and everything. And we're, we're just, yeah, we're always a few weeks behind. Yeah, I think even like, even so for stopping the spread of disease as well. But are your dandelions out? Are dandelions out in Dundee? <laughs> I haven't been checking on my dandelions. I haven't noticed them. All. <laughs> There's daisies. There's daisies coming out. Hi. Oh, daisies been out for a few weeks now. So, yeah. right. No, they're just they're just coming. All of our virtues are just yellow again. It's lush. 
Uh, the All right, no, well, all, no, definitely not, actually. No, yeah, we still just got daffodils, just that's about it. Except sadly, the weather's turned south again and sort of uh, and the bees aren't getting out and touching them at all, which is... Uh, no, nah, it's a few minutes. Yeah, it does seem to be picking up, but who knows? <laughs> and it's it's so cold. It's absolutely freezing, isn't it? I guess that's not very good, is it, for temperature-wise? It's cold no. big up here. Yeah, yeah. This morning it was bitter. At the cold, the wind was really nippy this morning. Um, yeah. And also, is there not a connection between the hay fever and, like, if you have local bees that would feed on local, I mean, the pollen from local plants, but if you're sensitive to the pollen locally, mm -hmm. then you want bees who are making honey from those plants in order to help you. Yeah, no, definitely. I haven't seen any solid research on that. Um, it might be there that I just haven't came across it yet, but it makes perfect sense. And I, I, I believe that. Um, I think it makes perfect sense that if the bees are collecting the pollen from the flowers that are around you, and you're consuming that, does that help? Yeah. That should help you bear with hay fever, but... Yeah, it's a bit like homeopathy, yeah. isn't it, I guess? It's a little, you're getting a little bit of taking something mm. internally that's been processed already by the bee. Yeah, the evidence is a bit sketchy, partly because the pollen that you mostly kind of gives you hay fever is windblown, but the mm. pollen that the bees collect isn't windblown, it's directly ah, from the flowers. Okay. So when you start getting down to the science of it, it's it's pretty... Uh, it, okay. yeah. Don't make too many health claims for your honey, because you might find it's probably good. <laughs> Not quite. Yeah. It's it's hard to it's hard to know. But I, at the same time, I'm being probably like you, have Dougie. You sort of find a lot of people going, "Oh yeah, it definitely works for me." So I'd like to see more research into the health benefits of honey because there's a lot of things passed around and kind of said that I'd like to believe some things like I do start believing. But I just I'm, I'm usually led by research. I like to see a bit of research on stuff. Uh, yeah. So it'd be nice to look more into it. Like they've looked so much. They've produced lots of reports on like the benefits of manuka honey, and um, to see that done with the honey in the UK, our local heather honey, or yeah. otherwise we'll look, it would be great. And then propolis as well. There's supposed to be stuff in that. Um, it's thought to like have antibacterial properties and help keep the um, bees high, beehive hygienic. Um, could there be some research in that and see how that can maybe help us as well? Um, maybe it doesn't. Cardiff University's done a reasonable amount because they're trying to find a, a, a honey that they can synthesize to do kind of uh, medical grade without having to use bees. But so far in the UK, right. they've, only find, they've only found one colony that really kind of mimicked sort of something like Manuka. And it's, yeah. a, it's a sweet story because it's this, it's this druid beekeeper in just on the borders of Wales in a place called Tawin. And he's got one hive, but hey, it's really cool honey, apparently. There's a guy in Scotland uh, doing some research. He did a talk a few weeks ago for Scottish beekeepers, and that was hmm. all about um, using honey on like medication patches for horses and stuff. Mm. Ah, I saw his talk advertising. I, I missed it. Was it really good? It was, was it... really interesting, yeah. Yeah. As long as he didn't mind seeing pictures of open wounds. <laughs> <laughs> what was his name oh god now you're asking <laughs> it, it was patrick pollock dr patrick pollock from patrick the pollock. edinburgh university ah oh, okay thank you i thought, I thought you might have watched that one so <laughs> he, he um he was using his own heather honey wasn't he they were trialing his own heather honey to see whether oh. it was effective but doing proper experiments on it. Um, it was a really interesting talk. Do you know if that was recorded soon? Yes, I think it was. I'm going to look for it. Um, yeah. I think, did we watch it on record? Uh, yeah, we watched yeah, it. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it, it is recorded. Sometimes the Scottish folks are, if, long term, you've got to be a member to access them. Mm. So you might, you might find it's recorded, but in a members only area. Um, I can I can see if I can find a link. Um, if I can find a link, I'll put it in the chat section. Uh, or I'll, if I can find a working link, I'll put it in the chat section so people can access it. Yeah, cheers, oh. Ian. I think it's usually only a couple of quid to being an associate member, isn't it, to get access to talks? Yeah. So 
probably wouldn't mind putting a few pounds in, um, in their pot. Yeah. Listen to that. Dan was a pesky Scott. <laughs> I think that the, I mean a lot of the stuff hey. with manure and, and wound dry, it, it works really well on the skin. I'm not sure, kind of by the time it's been through your digestion, there's less evidence for that being kind of. Uh, but for skin dressings, yeah, they they especially for burns and wounds that won't heal, um, it's it's quite widely used. Mm -hmm. But as you say, Sorry, I was just budding in there before. I was just wanting to check whether you can actually see or hear me. Yeah, yeah, hey, Madge Brid. Yeah, you can see and hear you. I've not done Zoom before. I usually do Teams, so this is a bit new to me. Ah, so. right. No, welcome. welcome. Okay, thank you. We're up to about Just gonna give it six, and yeah, as you say, Doug, you just give it a couple of minutes, let people kind of catch up, um, and then go for it. Hot saying that honey went well on cold sores as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, but when I was much younger, and I had a lot of acne, it was recommended to us to use manuka honey mixed in with some salt and um, to wash like and have with my acne. I don't know whether it's not, it wasn't scientific, it did eventually clear up, but maybe that was something else. <laughs> but being a beekeeper, of course, would like to believe that it does. does <laughs> I'll have to stick it on my labels. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a virtual background you've got, James, with a Batman? <laughs> it's Batman. I don't know. It's <laughs> I never I, I never use Zoom. I always use Teams. Um, it looks like you've used Zoom and put on a Batman background to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just Gotham City and Heaton Man. You just want to watch it. Like, um, <laughs> pubs are open now, man. Uh, yeah. Not in Scotland, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Don't brag. laughs> No, I no, they're open down. Down. A little message Sturgeon after this and tell that. Exactly, get on the keys. We twer. We're parched, yeah. There's, there's not a lot to brag about being in a beer garden in the sleet at uh, six degrees. Oh, well, it was cold, like, <laughs> I'll give you that. Like, it was, uh, <laughs> was, it wasn't great sat outside Time Bank last night, but it was, it was canny, it was worth it. Was I? If you saw Dougie, uh, Ian soon put up the link to that uh, the talk on horse, um, horses and honey. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Ian and Sue. It takes you to a registration page where you've got to put in your details, but I think it looks the same as when I access it, so it should be open to anyone. There's no, it doesn't seem to be a firewall on that side of it. So um, once you put your details in, you should should access it. But I haven't. I watched it a few weeks ago, so I haven't accessed it recently. Uh, no, great. I find that interesting. Yeah. I think I'll um, just begin if that's yeah, right. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Good evening, everybody. Thanks ever so much for coming along. Um, welcome to Newcastle District Beekeepers. Um, this evening, as you're probably aware, uh, our speaker is Stephen Douglas, aka Dougie, um, who's been beekeeping and a member for several years with us. Um, and he's going to talk. We've asked what we've asked is is that the first three years in beekeeping is a really critical time when it can be a bit of a make or break time. Um, and the newer you are, you may, especially in the second year, things can go a bit pear-shaped. There's even a magazine in the States um, specifically about those first three years to kind of help people. So this this talk is is for you and, and to kind of reflect on those experiences and, and sort of uh, help you along there. Over to you, Dougie. Thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, I must like to also like begin by saying thanks to your association for asking me to come along. Um, being a beekeeper, like anybody else who was a beekeeper, I love talking about bees. Um, so to be able to hone a group of people down and be able to blab on about what I've found so far, um, it's great, it's a privilege. I'm going to throw up a quick poll um, just to get an idea of what the group is made up of and what your capacity is as a beekeeper. If you haven't got bees at the moment, if you've kept them for a few years, and the way I've done it is through winters. Although usually when you get bees, um, you'll, you'll, your nuke will arrive around spring. Um, I kind of think that the start of the beekeeping season is like the end of winter, as springs begin. Um, so I've kind of like to count it on winters. You don't have to participate. It doesn't really mean much, just to give us a little idea of how many people we've got in that are new beekeepers, who's a very experienced beekeeper. Great. 
I'm already seeing there's quite a lot of people that are fairly new to beekeeping. Yeah. And this is, I think, a really good time to begin beekeeping. Um, obviously, everyone knows COVID, lockdown, whatnot, we've not been able to meet in person. Um, and what's been quite canny that I found with associations in the past couple of years, um, well, the past year, the, all the talks um, have been online. Also sharing with different associations, Hexton Beekeepers Association, who are with us tonight, have very kindly invited the Newcastle Beekeepers to join their talks. Um, and they've been able, we've been able to host like speakers from up and down the country, um, beekeepers from America have been able to talk to associations in the UK. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to come along on a Tuesday night or a Thursday in, um, afternoon or whatever to talk. So that's been great. There's a, a massive sharing of information going on. Also, a lot of beekeepers um, and people that like to talk about bees have been making videos and putting them online. So there's loads to find at the moment. And um, it's a really good time to get into it. Hmm. Oh, wow. We've got some beekeepers here who have been keeping bees for more than 20 winters. That's great. That's great. I really hope I get to that point. Like, oh, I really do. Um, smashing. I'm just going to roll into it. I've got a few, I've got a presentation um, to help guide me mostly, um, but there's some nice pictures in there that you, that you may enjoy. And then towards the end of the presentation, there is some, um, some videos. If at any point I start rambling on saying, oh, here's a video, and there isn't a video, please unmute yourself and just say, Doug, um, there isn't a video there, and I can sort it out as quick as I can. That's class. That's really interesting. Can you see, can you guys see the results from the pool? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're on there. Yeah, just to quench me a little bit of interest there. <laughs> share screen. I'm going to share my screen now. Bum, bum, bum. Lovely. Yeah, so the, the first three years of beekeeping. So I, my name's Stephen Douglas. Usually known if I introduce myself um, as Dougie. Um, and yeah, I've been keeping bees for this is coming out with my second winter. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about like who I am and where I come from. I'm originally from Newcastle, um, from the West End. And about three years ago, I moved to North Tyneside. Um, my working background, I left school, I went to study early years in child development and worked in nurseries. I then went on to work in children's centres. Um, working with families, doing community work um, with kids and families. I spent a brief time working in speech and language therapy, um, and now I run a sports inclusion service um, for a city council. So I'm very privileged to get to work with lots of lovely people, help them get into sports essentially. Um, so I get to go surfing and climbing and play sports with, with people, which is great. Um, and also, I'm a beekeeper, um, which has taken up a lot of my interest over the past couple of years. Next slide. So more about the beekeeping. Around 2010, um, while I was working at Scottswood, Scottswood Nature Garden, just in the West End, uh, um, funny enough, it's actually where I grew up. I grew up in front of Scottswood Nature Garden. I remember when I was about eight or so, um, I would be jumping over the, the metal fence to break, well, not break in, but to go and visit the pond and go and sit and watch the frogs and things. And it was nice, like it kind of sparked me love of nature. It was kind of me escape. I was able to go and visit this garden. Fair enough, I was outside of the hours, um, but I did. I ended up sometimes bumping into someone at work there. Um, I think it was called Stan. I remember one day he came over and he gave us a book. Um, it listed all the different flowers that were around there. And he also picked some of the flowers and put them in between the pages. Um, and alongside that, he gave us a pair of binoculars. And that really just sparked me interest, I suppose, in nature and insects. Um, I can also recall when I was a little bit young and um, a little bit older than that, I'd be sat on the side of the street just staring at the ground. Um, but what I was doing is I was catching little bugs from the pavement and putting them near the ant's nest and watching the ants come up and like retrieve those bugs and take them down. Uh, so that was great. And I went a bit uh, around the circle and ended up doing a bit of work with Scottswood Garden. And around 2010, I can't quite remember the date, and they put on a little mini beekeepers course. Um, so I went down and I was able to like learn about bees. I only attended the first week, unfortunately. I'm kicking myself for not going to that second week. Um, but yeah, that was maybe my first introduction to bees and kind of maybe planted the seed and uh, started some interest. So moving on from 2010, um, my son arrived in 2017. And this is me little, little boy called Koa. Um, and then when he arrived, Around that time, I was thinking, right, it's time to calm down a bit, stop the parking so much, stop wasting my time. 
um, and really think about these hobbies and interests that I've collected along the way and maybe try to pick one of them up and take it a bit more seriously. Um, and yeah, after a bit of thought and some other little events happening, like finding ground dwelling bees and contacting a colleague that I was working with at the time and seeing what to do with these bees. Um, I've been working on the garden and there's bees appearing from the ground. And it was Bridget, who was also a part of the Newcastle Beekeepers Association. And she said, I'll get a flower basket or something and put it above these bees. So when you are working in a garden, you're not going to disturb them, but they'll be fine. And that made us do a little bit more looking at the bees. And yeah, I thought, right, I'm going to try this beekeeping thing, see what it's about. So like most people, um, especially me being a, um, a millennial or whatever classification I should go into, um, I went on Facebook and I typed in beekeepers, found the Newcastle Beekeepers Association um, Facebook page. Um, I was doing a bit of research um, before that, I suppose 2018 is when I made my first contact. And the association, the um, best place to begin if you want to be a beekeeper, um, join your association, get some information from them, start talking to beekeepers. They answered lots of new questions, um, questions that I didn't, e well, they gave us answers that I didn't even know the question to. <laughs> Those providers of so much information about bees. Um, when I was thinking about which kind of hive to get, and I think about the different hive parts, there was always somebody there just to kind of give a little bit of advice. Um, and also from that first getting into beekeeping, obviously I had a very narrow understanding of what beekeeping might entail. Um, the Beekeepers Association was able to broaden my understanding. For example, the first association meeting I think it was that I went to, there was a uh, local artist, I think she came from Durham, um, and she came along and she was a beekeeper herself, and she was telling us how she's also an artist, and she was making the most beautiful art with, um, with wax, and she was dyeing the wax and then applying them to, I think, maybe canvases, um, and just making this really nice art. And uh, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but she also went in to say that um, wax, which she was using in, the, in her art, was also used to seal the um, wooden joints on really old shipbuilding. And there was a word for that that I can't quite recall. Um, but I thought that was amazing. Like my first time going down to a beekeeper's association, I was thinking, right, I'm going to maybe learn the anatomy of a honeybee or how to collect pollen or what goes on in the hive. But I was quite taken aback and impressed that they were actually getting an artist down to talk about something completely maybe different than beekeeping, still related to bees. So yeah, broad me, broaden me understanding that there's more to beekeeping than just being able to keep bees in a, keep bees in a box. Um, and kind of more importantly, maybe more importantly, you created a network. Um, I'm quite a social being. I enjoy being around people. Um, my line of work so has been working with people and within communities. Um, I, I just like people. <laughs> and the association was kind of a way to create a network um, with other beekeepers. Again, going back to the impact of, um, of the COVID lockdowns, the association as well is running the Facebook group. The, where they've set up like a WhatsApp group. Um, so just about every day, there's a bit of a conversation going on in there, usually to do with bees. Um, there's some people that I'll chat on with there. I've never even met. Um, hopefully I will once it all gets unlocked. But it's just been nice to be able to chat with other beekeepers, see, what, see what's going on with their bees, tell them what's going on with my bees. So again, I'll try to pin down people all the way through the day who might not want to hear about my bees. But um, on the WhatsApp group, there might be, there's usually someone that does. So, yeah, join an association if you want to start beekeeping. Um, can't stress that enough. They're, they're great. Next slide. So after I joined the association, um, I was talking to my friends. I was about wanting to be a beekeeper, and this gentleman on my left um, is a guy that I went to school with, and he's my beekeeping buddy, um, James M. Hoof. He's the whole experience I'm going to talk about um, throughout this presentation. And um, James is alongside. It's been nice sharing the beekeeping journey with somebody and um, scratching my heads together and thinking, right, what should we, what should we do next? Um, it's probably one of the best pictures. There's so much more incriminating pictures I could have used. <laughs> you got away lightly. <laughs> As if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, starting on my journey of um, starting on my journey, wanting to become beekeepers, joined the association, great. Um, spent a lot of time researching, reading the books, watching the videos, because there are quite a lot of good videos out there. I said earlier, I moved to North Tyneside and um, I was really lucky when I moved to North Tyneside, I got myself on the allotment list quite, quite soon um, and I pestered the guy around the allotment, around the allotments and managed to get myself a garden, um, which is great because I had hard moved into like an upstairs flat, shared backyard, it was really small, not much space um, and I was sat on Facebook as you do 
and I saw a post from the Meadowell Connector. They're a community centre in North Shields in the Meadowell. And they put a post on saying, we've got loads of daffodil bulbs left over. And if anyone wants some from your garden, just come on and get them. Um, so I thought, right, I love out for free. Um, get myself down to the community centre. Goes in the garden bit. Um, and I meet this young lass called Becca. And I say, all right, I'm here for my daffodil bulbs. We'll get chatting. I'm saying I'm new to the area. Um, find out a bit more about the centre. And then, like, as I was looking around, I noticed, like, this community centre has got loads of space. Um, and then in my mind, I was, like, obsessed and starting a little obsession with bees. And I started to think about where I could keep the bees. Didn't want to keep them on the allotment site because it's not so secure. Um, so I thought, well, I am sort of the person where if you didn't ask, you didn't get. Um, so I thought, bee cheeky, try me luck. I said, look, I'm, I'm wanting to become a beekeeper. Um, and I need a place to put my bees. Can I just come and put some bees on your land, basically? Um, and it was nice because straight away our eyes sort of like picked up um, and she said, well, actually, it's funny you say that. Um, about two years ago, we, we, well, we did have bees until two years ago. There was a beekeeper that kept bees here. He's now left and went on other things. So we've got like a purpose built apron. Um, we've got some kit left over. Um, yeah, if you want to get some bees and come in, let's start the process. So it was lush. Um, I'm obviously indebted to those guys. So the next week I was down there meeting the volunteer coordinator went through some formalities of doing the DBS check, making sure they're doing some background references, referencing um, checks. And then before I knew it, a week later, this knacker from the West End was given the keys to the community centre in the alarm code. And <laughs> basically just said, right, there's your space, come and go as you want, crack on. And of course it was, a, I did make part of the conversation saying that I would want full access coming and going. I think it's quite important when you're choosing an apiary. Um, for example, collecting swarms, we're gonna go on, I'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, usually when you've collected your swarm, you're leaving the box nearby and you're bringing it back at sundown. So I didn't want to just be confined by the eight till four. Um, but maybe a nice little story about try your luck, push your luck, we're looking for new sites. Yeah. I guess that was January 2019. We'd locked down a place. Here was here was a space where we could, we could keep bees. This little um, idea that me and James are having about becoming beekeepers, it was, um, it was going to become a thing, which is great. Yeah, so... We start from the association. We got advice and had a little look around the different places who made available bees, and, and we ordered a nuke in 2019. And for those that don't have bees yet, um, a nuke nucleus um, is basically just a mini colony, usually on six frames. We ordered a poly nuke, polystyrene nuke, polystyrene nuke, but you can't get them um, wooden, I suppose. And they're usually read, ready around June, around June time. So I said before as well, like much earlier, that sometime, well, the very beginning, I always think that the beekeeping season begins like around springtime, because that's when I've got my first bees. But I really think the beekeeping season, like kind of, well, it begins before winter, because that's the most important time. It's getting your bees ready for winter. Coming out of that winter, it all kicks off. And funny little story, I did get the bees from the Travelling Bee Company. When I heard about the name Travelling Bee Company, brand new to me went on the website right this is someone who sells bees can he must be a bee farmer um i'm down the association a few weeks after ordering my first bees massive smile on my face and dropping in the conversations oh, i've ordered my bees now and everything's all, all great and i see a guy that i recognize um, and again i was talking about scotswood nature garden and it's a guy that i used to work a lot well he was working there at the same time as me we didn't actually do any projects together and so he's passing us and I said, oh, Mark, like, nice to see you. I haven't saw you for ages. And he said, ah, oh, right. I do recognize you. How's things going? I went, yeah, really good. He's like, what are you doing down here? I said, well, I want to want to become a beekeeper. I fancy myself keeping some bees. Um, you went smashing. Have you, have you sorted any out yet? I went, oh, yeah, I've got some water from the Traveling Bee Company. <laughs> and then he just smiled and laughed. I said, oh, that, that's me. Um, so it was, it was great. This guy that I'd met years ago, hadn't seen him for ages. Um, and all of a sudden, I learned he's, he's a bee farmer, he's a beekeeper, which was lovely. And made a smile. So that's my bees ordered. Um, this is still around what February, January, February. Um, so I've got March, even May, June. I had to count that out, you know, how bad that's. I've got four months um, until my bees arrive. Time to do some more, some more proper learning and get excited. February 2019, there we go. That's around this time. I get, um, we'll see again on Facebook. There was a, a kind person called Sharon Glover, I think from the Townside Beekeepers Association. Puts a post out saying we've got some um, bee hives for sale, some secondhand bee hives for sale. Does anybody need one or want one? Um, so I went and met her on the allotment and came home dead happy with this um, bee hive, plonked it in the bedroom. And of course, my girlfriend's like, What, what, why are you got a bee hive in the bedroom? Like, what's happening here? 
Um, but that again was another step in early on in my beekeeping journey of me coming closer to becoming a beekeeper. Uh, for anybody that hasn't saw a beehive before, this is a, a um, what we call the national beehives. And um, it's comprises of a, a roof, as you might expect. These little boxes are the supers um, where you keep your honey. If you're looking to get a beehive, make sure you've got at least two, ideally three supers per hive, because these are going to fill up quick, quicker than you might expect. And um, this in between the supers, you might be able to notice is a crown board. It shouldn't be there. It should be above on top of any supers that you've got on top of your deep box. This is your deep box, brood box, nest box. I ain't a change in me, me terminology. And um, in between, I got a crown, a uh, queen excluder. Gonna want one of those. Not everybody does, but I'd recommend it. Um, and usually you could have a little hive stand. You might have a strap as well. Um, yeah, but I'm not really here to tell you exactly how to beekeep. I just want to share my, my story. March 2019. Um, so part of the association, I'm going down to meetings, really enjoying them. Learned loads about beekeeping. I've got myself an empty hive in my bedroom, <laughs> ready for me bees. I've got some where to keep bees. It's, it's all coming together. Um, I'm getting really excited for this, but still I've never... Um, opened a beehive. I've looked at bees on a wall, I've looked at bees around on flowers and that, um, but never actually been to a beehive. So Newcastle Associ Beekeeping Association, and they send out a newsletter, um, maybe more, yeah, newsletter called The Pheromone. So I was reading through that and I see a little advert saying um, our association, Apri, and there's a vacancy to take on an assistant. And just straight away, as soon as I see that, I think, class, here's an opportunity for us to be able to work alongside somebody who knows how to keep bees um, and maybe have an opportunity to learn how to manage bees and inspect bees and whatnot. And straight on, I think it was an email, straight on the email, hiya, I'm new to beekeeping. <laughs> I saw this um, advert, can I come along and help, help keep bees? I haven't got a clue what I do. Can you help us? Um, it was great, got a lovely response from Ian saying, yeah, let's sort it out. Um, and then from there, I was going down pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, and I was watching Ian um, as he was doing the inspections and picking up things along the way. This picture here, um, that just brings us so much joy looking at that picture, because that's actually the very first time that I stood in front of the beehive, which Ian was open. And I've got my Marigold gloves on, and along comes a, a little lovely foraging bee. Um, obviously, you can see a, a pollen basket um, loaded there. And I just sat stand there in absolute awe. Um, Ian, of course, he's brilliant um, teacher and he's telling us things as he's going through this hive box and I can't concentrate on what Ian's trying to tell us um, for having this little this fantastic base sat on my finger and then it just all just kind of sparked for us there all the reading I'd been doing and watching the videos attending association meetings I was like yeah this is amazing it's a, it's a privilege to, like see this wonderful amazing insect up close and um, it was great and she stayed there for qu quite a long time I was trying my best to listen to you Ian but I was I was taken aback by this beautiful little thing it was brilliant. I love looking at that picture. I might just put it on a wall one day. <laughs> so we were anticipating on waiting until June and um, when we nuke was ready. But again on social media, I noticed that there was a beekeeper saying he was wanting to um sell some colonies. He was downsizing. Um, does anybody want a beehive um, with bees in it? So straight away, me and James like, I we can get bees a little bit earlier. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Um, so 21st of April, I checked out the date and um, was when we went to pick her up, pick up our first beehive. So off I go, me and James, we've sorted out where, where bee suits. We jump in my car, go over through the town tunnel and um, this place in Gateshead and meet this beekeeper. Um, so it's a, a full national beehive. Um, so it's, you've got your floor, you've got your brood box and um, they'll have two supers. I think it had two supers, you know, it was massive. Um, you've got your roof, it's all strapped up, and he's like, right lads, here you go, here's your bees. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, he said, be careful though, um, there's some bees that obviously I've locked them up the night before, and some bees that went underneath the hive. If, if you keep bees, you'll know that if you shut up a hive, um, usually we'll get some stragglers which are going to be underneath. So me and James are a bit like, all right, a bit of experience, we don't really know too much what we're doing, but we're hiding in the back of the car, and then we're sat, sat in the car, on my way, we're on my way to leave, then we just decide, right, probably the safest way to do is just to put the veil up. <laughs> so we've got these two knackers driving along, going back through the time zone with this beehive in the back with the veils up, like just cautiously driving. It was great. Um, get ourselves to the, the meadow well, of course, where we've agreed to keep the bees. 
and we thought, right, well, to get it, it's a bit, not a massive walk, but it's like a, a couple of minutes walk up through the community garden into it, April. So we're both even out of this hive, kind of like cautiously, we know it's strapped up, but still we don't want to drop this hive with like thousands and thousands of bees in. <laughs> and then we get through a gate, again, that was a struggle. Get through the gate and place where and bee hive down. And we think, right, class, now we're beekeepers. <laughs> we've made it. We've got bees where we want to have them. And it's the first task. Take off the, the entrance block, of course, right? Dead easy. Not. <laughs> we're sat there, um, trying to take off, off this bloody entrance block. And we're saying, why won't it come off? We're jamming the hive tool in where we think that entrance block is. And we're, we're poking it, we're moving it, and we're like, I don't understand this. Like, what, what what's going on? Start thinking, right, maybe we should leave the apron, um, have a look on my phones, maybe see if there's something we're missing. Like, look at in, instructions. It must be instructions to remove an, an entrance block. Um, then I can't remember exactly how we realised, but we did realise that we placed the hive the wrong way around. So the entrance block is behind where we're trying to fiddle with. So after calling ourselves all sorts of words, we turned the hive round and we're able to remove the entrance block. Class. We remember in some of our learning that says to stuff the entrance um, with grass. Um, so it takes a while for the bees to emerge from the hive and they've already kind of um, realised they've changed position. Amazing insects. And they'll do an orientation flights. So we do that, we stuff the entrance with grass. Um, and again, this is maybe the first error um, that we made. No, the entrance block was the first error. <laughs> this is the second error that we made. Again, along, along the way, when you first become a beekeeper, there's lots of different bits of information and you're hearing lots of different things and got confused along the way. And for some reason, I thought the advice um, was to not open that hive for two weeks. So we didn't open that hive for two weeks. Two weeks later, we do open the hive and as, I, as you could maybe expect if you keep bees, and what I would expect now um, is that hive's congested, it's just, it's just been left. Uh, so we open the hive, we'll have a look through, and straight away we're seeing queen cells. Um, queen cells, another frame, queen cells, another frame, queen cells. Um, so we're like, right, oh, oops. Keep on looking through, come and find the queen. The queen's not there, but there was like literally, there must have been 25 queen cells or so um, down to us, not checking this hive. It's been bursting, we should have checked it. Um, much sooner than that, but we didn't. So I thought, how can we respond to this to this error? Um, and I think we'll handle it quite well. We thought, right, here's an opportunity then. We thought we were going to have one hive to start off with, but why not start off with a couple of hives? We've got some spare boxes. Um, so we're quite happily um, thinking that, yeah, we know what we're doing. T took out a few queen cells from that hive, uh, put them in an empty box, put some stores around that. Um, I think we're maybe, yeah, shaping a few bees, um, and essentially made a really rough basic split and got rid of all the other queen cells apart from two. At that stage, we were still even two queen cells. And I thought, right, surely, hopefully, fingers crossed when we come back, and these bees are going to start, some of these queens are going to emerge and we might have two colonies. It was a success as well. I was dead chuffed with that. And we did end up having two, two hives. So the hive that with the nucleus we're expecting in June and became a full hive and that full hive after a few weeks became two hives. So what we're doing now, Reese, if we said we wanted a hive, we've got, we've got two of them so far. Um, first inspection. So as I said, I was going down and um, Ian was very kindly letting us um, learn at the association here. We, and this gentleman to the left there is Neil Humphreys, um, kind of valued member of the Newcastle Beekeepers Association. You're going to get a bigger mention later on, mate. Um, yeah, so Neil's there as well. He's helping with photography and whatnot. But one day, after a few few weeks of going down to observe Ian and start soaking in some information, Ian said, right, Doug, do you want the opportunity? Um, you can do an inspection, like get yourself away. Um, obviously, the best thing to do when you're learning and good practice really is to say what you see while you're inspecting bees. Um, so I cracked the lid off. Yeah, we'll put it upside down. I remember I saw Ian do that. Take the crown board off. Yeah, class, that goes on top of the roof. Right, I'm going to pull my first frame. Um, so I use my hive tool, I'm pulling the frame out. And then you can say, all right, Dougie, what do you see? So I'm looking at this frame and I see all of these um, like cells that are sealed up. And I thought, right, I've read about this loads. This is me time to shine. And I say, brood. And you're saying, are you sure? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, of course not. It's funny. Um, yeah, but yeah, everyone makes mistakes. And it was a, it was a, it was a really good opportunity. Because um, at, this, at this point, I still hadn't opened my own base. Um, and yeah, it was a really nice opportunity of being able to do my first inspection um, alongside someone who's kept bees and has got loads of knowledge and is able to kind of gu guide us. Um, like, so thankful for that. So thankful. 
Yeah. Next slide. So there I am, I'm beekeeping away, I'm getting on with this, and then I keep on hearing something about swarms. I'm thinking, what are these swarms? Of course, like most associations, um, they recommend you be a beekeeper for a, a year before you get put on the swarm, keep, uh, the swarm catchers list, so we like to call it. Uh, but I thought, no, I'm not waiting a year. I want to get straight into this beekeeping. Um, for anyone that does know us, I can be pretty much all or nothing guy. I uh, say, so I'm not waiting a year before I can go and catch any swarms. So I uh, picked up the phone and I started texting and emailing some local pest controller guys saying, all right, I'm a new beekeeper. Um, I want to go and catch some swarms. If you find any swarms, give us a shout um, and I'll come and get them. We also by then made like a little Facebook page. We called it Pure Buzzing. We thought that was a nice little kind of name for bees. Um, and I put a little post on there. Hello, I'm being a beekeeper. <laughs> um, if you find a swarm of bees, give us a shout. I've never collected a swarm in my life, uh, but I'd read a bit about it. Listen to I think a presentation about it and watched a few videos, um, and yeah, the swarm calls came in. <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, the part of beekeeping which I really enjoy going out and collecting swarms. I think it's quite um, quite exciting. You get the call, distinguish is it actually a swarm or is it just a few bees hanging around, or in fact is it bumblebees? Um, and you think right, it's a swarm. So your kit's already in the car. Just keep your kit in the car if you drive, or keep it in a box near the door so you've got it ready to grab. Um, and off we go driving the car towards this location. Um, you don't know what you're gonna, you're gonna, don't know what you're gonna find really. In this instance, it was a group of bees just on top of a, a brick shed roof. And um, we've had swarms just like really inside of the bushes. Um, I've got another, another swarm that I'll show you in a moment. That's like really inside of a tree. And um, but like on the tree, the tree um, trunk is a small tree though. And um, it's great. It's great fun collecting swarms. Yeah. Not for the faint heart, I'd say straight away, because when you are collecting them, you're going to have bees all around you, all over you. Not just like a typical inspection when there's like a couple of hundred bees flying around. You've got thousands of bees flying over. Um, but it, it's fascinating. I'm not going to the process of collecting swarms. That's for somebody with more experience and, um, and for a different time. I'll keep on talking about my journey. So now we're getting to June 2019. And I've got a little video I'm going to share. Again, please, if the video doesn't start, and playing or you can't hear the sound just please give it a shout when we're sorted out um, but just to give you an idea this is my first season um, and this is what the April looked like in 2019 so this was the original hive and we've united the hive with the swarm that was in that new box a bit of newspaper in between a super Hopefully they'll make their way through the newspaper and become one colony. We saw a queen in there and an exclude has been added. This was the first split that we made. Another unite being done with a bit of newspaper and a super. Again, we should hope to see a nice strong colony in a few days. And we did see a queen in this hive. Obsessed with seeing the queen, <laughs> I suppose you always are. This was the first swarm that we caught. We saw a queen in there today. There's a queen excluder between the bottom deep box and the top super box. This is the hive that we bought today. It was fetched up from Gateshead. There's a queen in there. They're settling in, orientating themselves. <laughs> Get your words out. And this is the second swarm that we caught. We didn't see a queen. We saw eggs, larvae, and cat brood. Pure buzzing. <laughs> Pure buzzing. Who do you think you are? <laughs> yeah, so that was the state of our apiary in, um, in June 2019. So as you can see, it's here from there, but um, we've been quite active in collecting swarms, making splits, where we made a split in the first two weeks of so beekeeping, um, essentially. Um, yeah, so they were starting to fill out, we're starting to pack out, we're getting pretty busy in there, leading on towards the winter, preparing for the first winter. July 2019. Um, I'm just gonna check that. Can you capture swarms and leave them in a new box? I'll um, do... Travis, I'll answer that at the end if that's all right. I'll just come back to the um, to the chat. 
Great. Any questions, I as you think of them along the way, and um, do just put them in the chat. And at the end, you can either ask them yourself or I can just look at the chat box and then answer them. I'll get back to you, Travis. So July 2019, if you remember, I was saying I was down the association, I bumped, bumped in a mark, and that I soon realised was a bee farmer. Um, getting a bee from them. Along the way, when we were, we were chatting, I just kept on dropping in there. Like Again, being a bit cheeky, you have to ask if you ever need a hand, if you ever need some help, or if there's an opportunity for us to do so, um, can I come along and help you with your bees, watch you with your bees, give you a bit of hand? Um, and this kind of as well came about with, it might have been Ian or it might have been somebody else on the quote. I've just said somebody, someone in 2019, um, just said it might just be off the back of a conversation. To become a successful beekeeper, you should keep one high for 10 years. Also flip and that on the head, maybe you could keep 100 hives for one year. <laughs> so I was just really, I was intent on just this first year being a beekeeper, opening as many hives as I could, have a look at all the different situations that I could see present themselves and try to react to them. Um, which essentially is how you learn things. Yeah, so I was really lucky and there was an opportunity with uh, the Traveling Bee Company just to give them a bit of a hand and start looking through some bee hives for them and to see how they're doing. And it was great. I was just spending like pretty much a full day opening bees and um, seeing how they're doing and responding to them. And um, do they need more space to, but you know, just beekeeping. Um, it was class. I really, really enjoyed it. And I learned so much from it. Again, getting some guidance from such an experienced beekeeper so early on just gives a lot of hints and tips and maybe helped with my confidence of being a beekeeper as well. Mistakes were made. And um, of course, there were. Um, but again, that, that's part of learning. I really, I really think it's a big part of learning as well. Um, I was, I was, I was maybe meant to say this at the very beginning. Um, a great way I think to learn things is to say them to yourself or say them to other people. Again, a great opportunity to be able to do this presentation. It's just helped me kind of look back on my journey as a beekeeper and reinforce my learning. It's funny if you stand outside of like as the Aldi, other supermarkets are available and stand outside of them for 10 minutes and you'll see people just coming in the shop, like approaching the entrance, going right, bread, milk, pasta, toilet roll, right? I need to get this because if to rem remember something, you say it to yourself. It's the best way to, um, to remember something. So again, doing this presentation is just helping us, helping us learn. It's all, it's all a learning journey. <laughs> look how happy I look there. First harvest. And um, I think that's around August, September of 2019. And that's just sat there. Um, smug as I can be with my first jar of proper honey um, from my hives. It was class. We didn't expect it. I was told all the way along the way, which I think is quite right, don't expect honey in your first year. The aim of the game, I don't think it was ever to, to get honey. Um, it was to try to be, try to understand and just have the opportunities to work with these amazing little insects and um, that we call bees. Uh, but honey, it's a bonus and a sweet bonus at that. Hey, hey. Um, it was class. And I think we've got like 30 jars from the first harvest and um, was brilliant. It, it gone, it was, it was without the dawn, a flash. You know, all your family wants some, your, your mates want some, and you're eating it, just like drinking it from the jar. <laughs> it was great. Mm. It's a, a very welcome byproduct of a, of a good hobby. That's sweet honey. Ah, July. All right, so sorry that harvest was around July. I've done this in chronological order. July 2019, I get a phone call off my mate during the day. Um, like I'm self-employed at, at, that, at that time as well. And um, I get a phone call off my mate saying, right, I've got some business for you. It was like a Tuesday morning or something. So I'm at work and we've noticed there's a, a swarm outside of work. And um, you're a beekeeper, come and collect them. So I drop everything I'm doing. <laughs> um, no more work for the day. I'm going to collect a swarm. So again, it's um, July. I've already got me swarm kit in the car. So I've got a nuke box. I've got me smoker. My suit's always in the car in any case. Hive tool, it's all there, brush. So I get in my car, drive down to Newcastle, pull up outside the brewery. Of course, I've got the people's kitchen across the road. There's a tire place there. Behind there, there's like um, some university buildings. So it's it, pretty busy. Like, and um, the people are coming and going, like just noticing this fella sat there and it stood there in a bee suit. Like, what are you doing? I'm going to go and get these bees. And um, funny enough. So you can see it's a, it's a lush swarm, that as well. And they're kind of attached to the, the tree trunk. Um, and what I did there, I just, you can see this third picture. I was putting my new box below it and I'm literally just like brushing bees into this box. Um, and then there's that, sometimes just that turnaround moment when you're gathering swarms, that all of a sudden the bees that are in the box have just turned around, they put the bombs in the air, bzzz, they're flapping, they're, they're buzzing. And that's, that's probably um, what it is. 
the bees like kind of follow the pheromones, seeing the other ones, all the queens in here, um, cause bees communicate chemically through through pheromones. So there's a lush picture of them all gathered on the side of the box, being like, right, this is where it is, this is where we need to be. Um, it was lovely. I love collecting that song. So it was a lush July summer's day. Um, it was nice because again, I liked talking about what beekeeping is and whatnot. And there's loads of people passing me like, oh, what's going on? And being explained to people. Um, <laughs> I'll just remember as well. That's funny. When I collected this swarm, um, when you collect the swarm, you leave your box, whatever you collect them in, close by. So any straggling bees can return. There might have been some scout bees out finding the site or whatnot, or there might just be some like lingering. Um, so you leave your box there until around sundown. Uh, so I left my nuke just in town and um, put a little like barrier bit of tape there with st the, pe the people at the um, at the centre had like typed out little things saying honeybees, beekeepers, already like claimed them basically and just leave them alone, stay back. So I goes down to pick up this box at what, seven o'clock, eight o'clock or something when it starts getting dark. Um, and I got a text off James, said, oh, when the pub, <laughs> so I turns up with the pub. Thankfully, they're outside in the car park. That turns up the pub with his new box. <laughs> Don't want to leave in the car case that overheat. So I walks over to the picnic table that the sat at, puts it down on the floor, and straight away, James, James turns out and goes, Is that a beehive? I was like, Yeah. Um, <laughs> you need to have a pint on the way home. That was great. I've taken the, taken the bees for a pint. So, our first winter, we'll put six hives through our first winter. This picture on the left hand side, um, some people might recognize that. It's mouse damage. What we didn't do in our first winter is we didn't put mouse gods on the hives. Um, again, a mistake. You, I learned from them. Um, and yeah, that was the, that was the damage. Fortunately, that hive did pull through and the mouse didn't eat all the way through the colony. It did take a fair bit of the stores and a fair bit of the brews, um, but there was still a cluster with the queen um, come spring, which was great. So we took six hives into the winter and somehow six hives came out of the winter. I don't know how. Um, I keep on, yeah, I keep on hearing very experienced, some, yeah, people people saying expect to lose some hives. I didn't lose any hives in that first winter. Um, but that's more down to the bees being fantastic and highly evolved and down to our um, flaky skills at times. <laughs> so May 2020, I've got another video just to show an example of the state of what we are and how we're doing in the terms of beehives and um, just coming out with the first winter. Lovely pictures of me bees there. I'll try not to look at them too much and show you the video. We'll crack on. Again, please tell us if um, this is another week at the apiary. There were six hives here last week. We've got nine colonies. There's a colony in this box, which is now making a new queen. Queen cells have been drawn. This hive's have gone like the clappers. It's, uh, it's taken right off. It's brilliant to see. That's our very first hive. Right. We've brood and a half. Can't We've got the one full nest box. We've got a half a nest box, which is called a super. And at the top here, unfortunately, that's, well, either way you look at it, that's full of honey. Really heavy. <laughs> so eventually we'll swap these boxes around and um, give, put them on double brood and put a little honey box at the top. It's just easier to spin, easier to lift. These girls, they were putting eggs in queen cells. So they were gonna swarm eventually. So we're probably lucky we've got there on day one or two with the swarm preparations and we've made a split. Queen's in here, the original queen. All the flying bees have had to move to think they've swarmed. And in there is all the brood, the queen cells with eggs on and a lot of nurse bees will remain, and they'll fetch up a new queen, they'll make a new queen. We'll leave them for a month. These guys are doing fine. This little box, it's a bit knackered. A bit. But we took a couple of frames of brood and eggs from that huge colony. That one, because it was just so full. So we just gave them some more space to play with and for her to lay in, the queen to lay in. We took the, the extra brood and eggs. They'll probably fetch up a new queen. This Conley's doing fine. They actually overwintered in that little knackered box. It was, we didn't think they would get through, but they have and they're drawn out. Loads of wax. They're doing the job, busy bees. And finally, this little hive chilling in the corner. 
They're lovely. Lovely bees. They're doing really well. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's space there for more bees. <laughs> Seven, eight, nine. Yeah, as you can see, what we're doing, we uh, started in that coming up the first winter, um, kind of second year. We're still increasing the amount of colonies that we had. We were making that was a mixture of making splits um, and catching swarms. Um, as I said, if you remember that um, really small nuke box, it was battered, and that was second hand to us. And there was cracks in the roof. There was cracks everywhere. And towards the end of our first, um, well, towards the beginning of our first winter, when we were preparing for winter, we'd run out of kit. Um, we had this swarm that we'd caught in that box and we're like, well, we've got nowhere to put it. Um, but they were on, obviously, they were on the frames, there was brood in there, there was a queen in there, there was some stores and we thought, well, we haven't got a hive to put it, to place it in and to prepare. So let's just leave it and see what happens and see if they come through. And they actually pulled them through. I couldn't believe it. Like, um, coming through in that knackered, horrible little box. <laughs> but as you can see as well from the rest of the boxes, a lot of my hives, a lot of the hives are secondhand. Um, and the bees, the bees do it they get through and um, it's nice to have some first time new boxes i suppose um but yeah it's making with what you can make with what you can that picture down there as well for that pollen and that's lush all that different all those different colors beautiful so the 19th of april that's when we played the fanfare do, 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 do. We'll have, i felt, felt like i leveled up as a beekeeper and um, we thought we're going to start marking the queens. Um, so, of course, the start of next season, um, they're going to be easy to find. And we're, we're realising when we were making splits, it was taking quite a while to spot these queens. So, if, again, if you're new or you just learned about beekeeping, when you mark the queens, you just dab, um, you just dab over with a little paint pen. So she's coming up with a colour, green, blue, um, or whatnot. It's just easier to spot in amongst loads of bees. So we'll order a queen cage um, from Thorns. Get with pen. I ordered the wrong pen, of course. Another mistake. Uh, so all were bees and um, all were queens at that time were marked red. But again, there was this more of the case of being able to identify it. So we'd spend some time practicing on drones. And I've got another little short video to share of one of my first experiences of queen marking. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to mark this queen that's going through. Then should be much easier to find on next inspections than if we ever need a split. Disaster. Mm -hmm. Disaster. <laughs> that's a um, frame that's split all over. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go on my bag and find something to tie it up with. Like. <laughs> that was a bit of a disaster. Did not expect that. So again, um, having making lots of splits and catching lots of swarms. We didn't have enough kit to keep up with the amount of colonies that we had. Um, so I had a lot of like blank frames and no foundation to put in them. So in some colonies we were putting in some blank frames um, and the bees started drawing them out. And um, so obviously I picked up this frame, went to market, held it on its side. And it, I was taught this, Ian showed us this, I should have laid the frame over my arm just to prevent that happening, but I didn't. And um, the frame wasn't wired. So the weight of all the brood had collapsed. Um, and then, yeah, I shout disaster, I imagine not to swear. <laughs> and then there was that kind of brief pause where it's just like, right, Dougie, think. And my head was gone and right, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I thought, right, I right, this is what I need to do. Um, I've heard someone say this before, get yourself some fish and wire. Um, and luckily, when I'd heard that, I'd put some fish and wire, some thick fish and wire in my bee bag and went to there, strapped up the frame. And um, great result. The Queen survives. Um, she didn't get marked, of course, that day. <laughs> but the queen survived, the colony survived. And before, like during the season, we were just moving that frame closer and closer at the edge just to get it rid of it and get it, get it out. Um, but another example of when things can go wrong, things are going to go wrong when you start off beekeeping. I suppose any craft that you take up, any hobby that you take up, things are going to go wrong. Um, but dealing with those things um, is where a lot of learning comes in. June 2020. This is at my friend Mohammed's house, um, another member of the Newcastle District Association. He said, Dougie, come on up. And he gives a hand to me bees, come and have a little look at them. So I went up, had a look at them. And existing beekeepers with a keen eye might notice that there's a lot of bees at this entrance. Uh, so that means that I've just done an inspection. 
me and my, me and Mo were dead excited. Like, yeah, it's been nice to go through bees together, nice to catch up and whatnot. And let's get a picture in front of the bees. So Dafty here got me veil off. I start unzipping my suit, unzipping my suit because it's quite warm. And I'm there again with a big um, with a daft like smile on my face and thinking, right, I'll get my picture taken in front of these bees. And what I shouldn't have expected anything less, less than two seconds after this picture being taken, I just feel this little tingle on my shoulder um, and some are crawling down my neck. And I'm like, oh no, that's two of my hand. I go, there's a bee, there's a bee went down my back. Can we sort it out? And straight away, I stand up, he starts trying to get a hold of it. And then, yeah, I get stung in the um, in the shoulder and it bloody hurt. <laughs> it really hurt. So driving back from Mohammed's there on the way home, I've got him sulking. I've got a right sulk on my face. I'm thinking, I've had this great day. And um, I spoiled it towards the end of the day by making a staff decision to get me, me picture taken in front of it. And be high. Don't do it. <laughs> One out of 10 would not recommend. <laughs> Just keep your veil on. Keep your veil on. <laughs> July 2020, what a privilege it was to be involved in this. Um, I get a shout, I think it was from Ian saying they needed a bit of a hand extracting some bees. So it's not just swarm collecting this time. This colony had taken up residence in the top of this bay window. Um, Ian had been talking to a pest controller who was going to come and help oversee the job and like do the, the hardware, removing those, like, um, those slats. And there was also a bit of lead that needed taken up. Um, and we spent, I think it was six hours, like removing this bee colony, it was absolutely amazing. Like, first of all, getting to see these feral bees, um, for one of a better term, like how they set up their colony, seeing how they were making a home and taking up residence in this place. Um, and the picture down there, you can see again, I've got a bee on my hand, just like that first time I um, watched the beehive being open, and I was looking at this little bee sat there, it was class. There's a time lapse I'm going to put on now um, of this job. Brilliant. If you ever get the opportunity to do it, do it. It's a sticky job, it's a long job. But I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Maybe not for the faint heart of this situation, because we are up ladders there. <laughs> and there's part of it. Just remember in the back of your mind, I'm on ladders. I'm on ladders. I'm on ladders. Don't step back. This video is a time lapse. It's, it's supposed to be clunky. Um, but you get an idea what we're, what we're doing. It was great. Again, tell me if it doesn't work. Not what I clicked on. <laughs> opportunity like um, if you want to look at that again it's on the um, Newcastle Association's YouTube page and you can have a little, 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 little look at that but that experience as well just really increased my confidence of working with these because you, you, your head's in it there like um, you're, you're really in their territory but not just you're not just keeping them in a box you're, you're, sub, you're submerged in bees <laughs> it was great absolutely great loved it what a day and um, look at that lovely picture so I've managed to find myself a new site. Um, yeah, we've got the community centre, but I've also got the site on a bit of farmer's land and um, quite close to my house, which is very useful. Um, and these two hives here um, were given, given to me by a good friend, Neil Humphreys, again, part of the association. Um, unfortunately, he developed a, a bad reaction to, to bees things and decided that it just wasn't worth the risk anymore and um, keeping bees. So really kindly said, Doug, 
could you take the bees and look after them? Um, and I put them in this lush setting. I mean, look, look at that picture. I love that picture. And it's a, it's a proper joy going down to see these bees because they're on a lovely, peaceful bit of land. Um, and yeah, I just love working through them. So thank, thanks very much, Neil. There's another box of honey coming your way very soon. <laughs> yeah. September 2020, um, here's another harvest that we were doing. We started doing cut comb as well. Uh, so we're putting some frames there, unwired um, foundation and just cutting through the comb. Lovely, you can bite straight into that, spread on your toes or whatever. Um, filling up jars, it was all good. We we're doing it at home. But here's a little video to go alongside of it. It's not long, this video. It's not long at all. But it's another mistake. No, it isn't. Not that one. Hey, it's Dougie from Peter Buzzin. I'm today. a cowboy hat. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Right there, bees all over. That's what it is. So you might notice, I've been lazy here. I've stuck my supers outside after extracting. And look, they're covered in local bees. I should have known better. I'd extracted the honey, did what I needed to do. Um, I thought, well, I can't get down the allotment right now where I usually store my stuff in the shed. I'd stick them outside for a little bit um, and take them down soon. Um, and that little bit turned into a long time. Um, and unfortunately, I did wait until my girlfriend got home and got an absolute earful over why there was some beehives outside covered in bees. I don't think at first I really appreciated how many bees were around them. Um, until I started getting shouted at and I had a closer look and they were, they were bloody covered. So I had to get uh, some bed sheets and wrap them over these supers and stickies, maybe they're called, um, and hide them in the back of the car and take them away. Um, I should have known better. Again, it's not good to open feed bees and honey. I could have been risking spreading disease into somebody else's beehive. Um, I definitely, definitely learned from that. Probably shouldn't have been something that I needed to learn, like, but we know. November 2020. Um, I'm, this obsession's taken full hold of this. I'm, I'm loving keeping bees. I'm thinking, right, right I want to do more of this. Um, I was introduced myself earlier and I said that I come from a background of working with communities and working with people. So I thought, right, how do I bring these two things together? I see an opportunity to run a crowdfund crowdfunding campaign. And I said, right, I'll take my chances again. Um, and I made this little video to apply for some funding, which I will now share with you. Not long left, guys. We've nearly hit an hour. This is towards the end. Oops. Let's start from the beginning. I like to help people coming out with these lockdowns. Come to. That's me playing guitar as well. <laughs> Hi, my name's Stephen Douglas, and I keep bees in North Tyneside area. Over the past few months, we've all been involved in various lockdowns. It's impacted in the way in which we can lead our lives. I like to help people coming out with these lockdowns come together in a meaningful way through beekeeping. I've kept bees for a number of years. I found that it has a really positive impact on my mental health. It's a very mindful activity. During this project, I like to work with a number of volunteers from different backgrounds, different ages, people who might not usually meet together. Meet on a weekly basis, start from the very beginning. We'll learn skills to assemble beehives and build, build hives. We'll then get out in the apiary where we'll have these beehives. We'll put bees in the hives that we've made together. And we'll meet every single week, managing these colonies, learning how to respond to the bees' needs and learning about the bees as we go along. If you can, please pledge a few quid or maybe even more. <laughs> We're looking to get 10 beehives to place at the Meadowell. Um, and as I say, these beehives will be built by the group which we make. Um, the bees are put in there and we manage them throughout the year. As well as the people participating, being able to get a positive impact from learning these new skills. Of course, we're providing a pollination service to the Meadowell area. All the gardens and allotments are gonna have these bees visiting. At the end of the project, who knows, we might even have some honey to share with the community too. Thanks very much for listening. If you can, please get behind this project. I'd love to make it happen. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone. There's that daft picture again of us sitting in front of the beehive. <laughs> Terrible. Don't do it. Don't do it, guys. Um, yeah, so I put together a bid and um, to tried to raise some money to deliver a, a community beekeeping project. Um, and then around Christmas time, I found out that I was successful. I was dead, dead happy about very chuffed. I was pure buzzing. 
in fact, uh, managed to raise £5,214. Um, big chunk of that came from the North the Time Combined Authority, and they pledged a lot of money towards that. It's also a few organisations um, and a lot of individuals as well giving us money. What I loved about that is at first I was obviously texting my mates saying, look, I'm doing this because a tenner if you can or a fiver. And before long, there was like people that I didn't know, strangers, um, maybe we can call them, giving us money. And I was emailing everybody who donated saying like, thanks very much. And the people that I didn't recognise asking, why have you given us money? I don't even know you. <laughs> and they're just saying, I think it's a, it was a nice project. So uh, I'm forever in that, but those people's debt. Um, I have actually started that project. A few members that are part of it are along here tonight. Um, and we've started on Zoom um, three weeks ago. So I'm just delivering some theory sessions at the moment using Zoom. And we're planning to meet um, quite shortly at the Meadowell, starting to assemble those beehives. And we've got we're, we're 10 colonies on the way. Um, success, I was, I, was, I was very chuffed, very chuffed indeed. And I decided I want to take this a step further and take it further still. I'm really enjoying keeping bees. I'm enjoying delivering this community project. Um, can I maybe make more of it? I mean, the response that I had of applicants to the community project was it was it blew us away. Um, I'm talking like emails upon emails upon emails upon like communications about people want to get involved. So I saw a need there. Um, I have actually registered and set up now a community interest company um, called Pure Buzzing. I'm not going too much about it because this uh, presentation is about me first three years. Um, if you want to find out anything more about it, communitybeekeeping.co.uk or Facebook, um, Pure Buzzing, and you can find out a bit more. Um, class there's I started the presentation with the picture when he was a little wee dot and that's me my son Koa and I'm really chuffed that nowadays um, he's a little bit older and he's got his own suit he comes up with the bees like, which is great over there just this morning a little bee land on his veil and the first couple of times when that happened that was game over I had to leave uh, but this time he kind of looked at it looked a bit unsure then we started laughing and he laughed about it and then bees were landing on his arms and whatnot and it was great we just had a good a good little laugh so thanks very much for tuning in and to listening to us. Um, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, <laughs> either unmute yourself, um, make yourself heard, or pop in the chat box. I did say uh, Thank you question. so much, Dougie. It's, it's, it's so nice to hear your passion and your enthusiasm and your sense of adventure for this as well, because you're right shy bands getting out um you do need to kind of be a bit out there and you do need to if you want to get the experience then you have to ask for it if you want to get an apiary site you need to sort of ruffle some feathers and ask some people and and put yourself out there and, and kind of it won't come to you um yeah and you've moved I have been really, along really the way quickly lots uh, but um it, it won't be given to you you're right yeah and that's and that's tremendous and you're absolutely right you learn it by doing and thank you for your honesty about about making mistakes we all do some people are more honest about it than others but we will all mess things up and we will all make mistakes we will all learn from them um let's let's kind of have a look at a few written questions that have come on uh, come in and then uh, we'll take some sort of uh, ones if people want to unmute when we're through those um one of the questions that came in early on, though, I was thinking of this one myself, is when you were starting out, often the trouble is that you get baffled. There's just, especially at the moment, there is so much volume of, of stuff, some of it mm. good, some of it bad, some of it indifferent. What was your process of sifting? And have you got any recommendations about what you found useful and less useful? Yeah, um, useful book, the Haynes Manual of Beekeeping. Um, if you've ever worked on cars or owned a car, and you probably saw the Haynes Manual for just about any car out there. They do one for beekeeping. And that was a really good resource. But um, the very best resource, uh, I said it a few times over me uh, presentation, join the association. Um, again, I was looking at YouTube videos. I was reading websites. And there is a lot of kind of conflicting advice. But that's maybe because there's multiple ways to do things. And some people are wrong. <laughs> but I decided quite early on that I was part of the association. I was going to join this. I was going to take the association's line and the association's I think you guys at the association kind of do set up a really good framework for getting started as beekeepers and how to manage bees. And I decided just to follow that framework. And there are some things that I would now do slightly differently. Um, but yeah, that helped us kind of like weed out. As I said as well, when like the first time we got a beehive, I'm sure I wasn't told to leave it for two weeks. That was just again getting confused and things getting muddled up. And um, but here it ended up coming up and um, top trumps because I doubled my hive. <laughs> I've got two hives out of that. Yeah, so join the association, listen to what those guys are recommending to do. 
And I think that's maybe in a sense where we've sort of stepped forwards now because with the WhatsApp page and stuff like that, if you find yourself out in the field and you do get into a little bit of a kind of like, oh, hang on a minute. What I mean, sometimes we have been able to give people some real time advice, um, which sometimes is, is quite handy. Um, Although yeah. the scariest one a while ago was when there was a guy who was uh, getting very close to anaphylactic shock while I was walking around Asda. I'm going, well, I'm starting to feel faint now. I'm starting to feel like, if you don't call 999, I'm calling them for you. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't I want to well, do that. I don't I want if to I can, do that I, if I can add to that as well about seeing like when you're first, when you're starting out, when you're not sure what to do. Oh. Um, not sure. Just give it a shot. Yeah. Um, because even if even if it doesn't come up um, true and you've done it wrong, that kind of kind of so what, um, you'll do it right in the future and you're going to make mistakes. So just give it a shot and do something instead of nothing. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. yeah, <laughs> I, yeah cool. I think there are times when making a decision is is better than making no decision. And as you say, if you recognise it was a bad decision, you won't do it again. Yeah, hopefully not. It's a little. Uh, Bees can back carry 300 times of their body weight. Is that correct? I don't know. I think there's something like that for ants. That's way out of my league. Like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I vaguely do know what, what kind of weight they can carry, but I can't compare it to body weight. Oh. So we'll get back to you on that one. I hope so. Um, capturing swarms. Can you leave them in a nuke box or do they need a full-size brood box? You need to, you need to judge the swarm, really. Um, I think Travis asked this. Um, it's a good question about swarming. Um, when you're the first swarm that will leave a hive will be the prime swarm that will be your mated queen leaving initially with like thousands and thousands of bees and um, those swarms can be absolutely huge like Travis and those ones you'll soon find when you're collecting it they're bursting out of the box you want to put that in a hive as soon as possible um, cast swarms so the swarm that leaves after um, they've got less bees so some of those swarms we do just leave in the nuke box but it is a, a case of just having to judge um, all these bees bursting out of the box, flying, fair enough, but if they're too, if they're too congested, hide them in a hive, and um, if not, just leave them, leave them in the nuke. Yeah, as you say, a nuke box is sometimes quite handy to put them in, but there's some swarms you turn up to and you look at the swarm and go, I need a bigger box, <laughs> it's not fitting. Yeah, um, God didn't show me full swarm collecting kit, uh, but part of that's a big cardboard box, usually an Amazon box, um, which the nuke box is inside, so if we get there and the nuke's not good enough, and we've got a huge cardboard box to hide them in because that works. And I think your point you made earlier about if you are on the swarm collectors list or you have got bees, have a have a simple kit. It's not a lot of stuff. It's a box. Uh, it can be a cardboard box. It's it's your smoker. It's a sheet. Um, it's a few bits. A pair of secateurs doesn't go amiss to chop a chop a branch or whatever. Um, but mm. have it re have it instantly available because it will be at the most inconvenient time you get a call for that when you're least prepared. Um, so yeah, it's it's pays to be always ready. Um, how much feeding were you doing in the spring coming out of winter? Um, and sort of, Gary sort of saying some say feed, some say don't feed. What any thoughts? It's interesting that um, again different ways different ways of beekeeping. And the first year I was feeding a lot. Um, going into winter, I fed, 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 fed until they wouldn't take any more syrup. Um, I always from the very start of beekeeping and some of that was explained to us from the association some of that was reinforced to me through Mark and um, again he's a bee farmer not every bee farmer does this but kudos to him because he leaves a full super of honey um, don't harvest past a full super of honey there's a I've had conversations that sometimes turn into like debates with other beekeepers and let's say well it's no different you can take all the honey feed them sugar it won't make a bit of difference um, I haven't came to understand any solid research or I can't like recite the research to say that why um, honey's better for them. Yeah. Well, I just bloody believe that honey's better for bees. It's what they make, it's what they create, it's for the natural pollens. So I don't take, um, James, me and James, we don't take anything past the first super. We always leave a super. We did still feed them a lot in the first year and um, going into winter, coming out of winter to help them um, build up for spring. We're coming into my second winter, which just came out with, again, I've had a 100% success rate. Um, don't ask us how, because I can't really tell you how. Um, but we didn't feed at all, and we didn't need to feed at all, because we just kept an eye on what we were extracting, what we are harvesting, and we let those bees build up um, nice and strong and build up a lot of honey. Um, I was, I did have fun and ready over winter, when I was obviously hefting my hive, and I was checking that they weren't getting too light. And if those bees needed it, I, I had fondant to put on. Um, I still got fondant ready to put on if I need it. 
or as soon as it's getting warm, I'll put syrup on. But I'm trying, I'm trying not to feed me bees essentially. And um, but if I need to, I will, which is important. I'm not doing that because I don't want traces of sugar in me, in me, um, in me honey. Essentially, I don't want lilac taste um, sugar and um, honey. Um, also, I think that just it's better for the bees. It's what they want to eat. It's what they collect. Surely, surely it's better for them. Um, I'll find I'll find a little research to back, back up what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean you're right. Honey syrup, uh, honey is different from syrup. It's got a whole mixture of enzymes. It is uh, it's 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 very high content sugar, but it's not the same. Um, and I yeah. think again, it's it's important. And as you say, with Mark, it's it's a respect to him as a, as a bee farmer because the honey is is sort of uh, is living. Um, but he is generous and leaves and leaves uh, honey for the bees for for them to. And it's important um, because if you yeah. get the balance wrong. A starved out hive is now used to anybody. That's um, it. Julie asking sort of uh, when you picked up a swarm and you've got to evening time and you want to move it and it's in a cardboard box, how do you do it? And um, put a blanket over it, like a, a sheet. <laughs> yeah. So the cardboard box, uh, you've left like the four flaps on top. Um, um, yeah. And you've put it up, you put it upside down, you put them in there, there's a little hole in the bottom. You put a, a sheet, whether it's a cardboard box, whether it's a nuke. Put a light sheet, a bed sheet, essentially. Don't tell me girlfriend that uses bed sheets. Um, oh. Put a sheet over it, put it in the back of the car. And um, when you're driving the car with bees, like I explained when we first picked up a hive, like had with suits on. Um, it was funny as well, just recalling, I used like a, a vape. I stopped smoking a few years ago. And that's something that's got like fruity vapors. And I remember vaping from your bee suit and then Jim turned into us being like, Doug, you put that down. You're going to attract the bees. Like it's a fruity smell. <laughs> it was funny. Um, but anyway, I digress. And when you are driving bees, put your back windows down. So the air coming in through your back windows and that'll stop any bees, well, make it harder for them to come forward. Um, but essentially, when you've got bees in your car, you're going to have bees on your shoulder and coming around you. So to get used to it. <laughs> they normally kind of just sort of settle on the back windscreen. The vibration seems to calm them somehow. And they I don't think I've ever been stung in the car by bees. Sometimes when they come flying on your shoulder when you're not expecting it, it's a bit, Whoa! but yeah, uh, and, and they can wear your bee suit in the car, but it's, it's they're normally pretty peaceable. I use a, mm. I've got an old mosquito net, um, and I just sort of wrap anything in that. And as you say, if you've picked a heart, if you picked a swarm up, often you use a sheet underneath it when you put the nuke box down. And it's the easiest thing in the world just to wrap the sheet around uh, around yeah. the hive and just bundle it back because there will be loose bees, and you're not going to spend all evening there trying to chase every bee into the hive. It's it's just not going to happen. Mm. Yeah, my family had to get used to driving with bees as well, especially when I was helping Mark out and I was shifting a lot of bees backwards and forwards to different places. And they would, by the end of the day, there'd be loads of bees in my car. I'd go to take the kids to school the next day and they'd be like, why are the bees in the car? Like, what are these doing? So it would help them get used to bees as well. Yeah, they, 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 after, over time, they do get a lot of comments like, oh, dad, bee. <laughs> so yeah. not sure, shrieking and horror, horror that you get at most kids at a moment like that. So. <laughs> Mind you, as you say that, it reminds me when we were doing that cutout from that roof. Um, yeah. There was the the guy who lived in the upstairs flat who was the one who was kind of getting quite worried about it. He'd got the landlord to shift them. Um, him and his son, kind of, he had a young son, kind of, sort of like Garfield at the window for about six hours. Yeah. Watching us do this. I don't know I if they were horrified you. or whether they were just sort of relieved that they were going. But, <laughs> yeah. I was such a good like you. It was amazing. Better than watching Peppa Pig on the telly. That, that's yeah, kind of it for uh, the sort of questions that are coming on the chat. But um, if we've got questions, um, uh, just unmute yourselves and please feel free to shout out. I can't see both screens at the same time. So I'll um, maybe if you take the first screen, W, I'll go for the second one. And uh, um, Madge Breeth just asked um, right. Have you inspected your base for the first time this year? It's been advised to wait until it's warmer. Um, I have managed to put my head in every beehive so far. Um, I took my opportunities early on when it got warm enough, um, but I didn't do a full inspection. Um, I waited until, got advice to wait until it's T-shirt weather, um, and there's a gap in, the, gap in the clouds, the sun's out. Again, I'm lucky enough at the moment, um, I do actually work self, on a self-employed basis one day a week as a gardener at the Meadowell Centre, um, which is class. So on my lunch break, I can see my bees if there's an opportunity. So yeah, I have taken the opportunity to go into see me bees, but it's not a fun inspection. I'm going in and the first week, I just looked at the supers at the top, had a look at the stores. If the one hive didn't have enough stores, I was taking stores from another one, balancing stores. Um, and then I, when I did go in the brood nest, I was really quick. Um, I looked in and as soon as I saw eggs, I closed them back up. 
uh, because eggs indicative of queen. Um, I don't need to see the queen. In the first year or so, I was obsessed with finding the queen every time. Where's the queen? Let's spend ages, um, which I suppose is nice. But now, I say eggs, there's a queen, close them up, leave them. Because you're right, it, it's cold at the moment. But yeah. I'd rather take the opportunity and let the bees warm back up than risk waiting um, and maybe open up a dead hive. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that, that you'll have found and most of you who are kind of, well, whoever started out in beekeeping, the first couple of years, it's the classic thing. You ask three beekeepers, you'll get at least four different opinions. And that can be mm. really hard early on to know, well, who do I believe? And sometimes you just have to take the sort of balance of sense and find someone who seems to be saying <clears throat> what you, what makes sense to you and go with it. Um, it's, I mean, like Dougie, the early inspections this year, kind of, uh, I was doing them back end of March when the weather was kind of doing some nice things. Um, and I'm kind of glad I did because now we've had two weeks plus of kind of really rubbish weather when I haven't wanted to go into them at all. But at least I know where they stand. Yeah. They, I'm yeah. not panicking that they're really kind of struggling or that I haven't had a chance in. So it's, it's really variable. I mean, I was talking to, I did some training with a church group last year and the vicar up there is, is a lovely chap um, and, and very wise. And he was talking to me about sort of um, uh, Greek ideas of time. And he said, do you know that Greek, Greece, Greeks have two concepts of time? And one is Kronos, linear time. And the other one is Kiros. And he said, that's the right moment. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, yeah, yeah, that really applies to beekeeping. It absolutely the right. There is the right moment to do something. And, it's, and, yeah. it, and, you, and part of your, as you learn as a beekeeper, is knowing what that moment is. Yeah, definitely. It is taking chances. Um, and again, if you get it wrong, it is bad maybe that you've impacted on, like you might have hurt the bees, but then again, the highly evolved, resilient insects, if you get them cooled, the warm cells back up. Um, yeah. warm cells back up. I'm still to find the, the queen from last year. I could not find her last year. Um, I really want to mark her because I'm, I don't um, think I'm very trained in actually finding a queen, to be honest. Um, yeah. So, I'm dying to get in there before it gets too big again, the whole swarm. Yeah, but, uh, we're doing a talk on bit... that, but not till June. Yeah, all right. Are you seeing eggs? Have you saw eggs in there, Madge Britt? I haven't been in yet. This is what I'm all saying. Right. I'm dying okay. to get in there just to see. Yeah. Um, I've got two hives. Um, one's quite big, and the other one, basically, I, I, last year, they, um, they produced a queen cell or right. several. And I chose one because I have a, a red queen. So correct me if I'm wrong, that's 2018, yeah? Is that correct? Um, I don't know, I'm too, too be as deep now, so I can't guess. Yeah, yeah 2018. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she's getting a bit old, so I was thinking, maybe that's hmm. why they want to get rid of her. So I moved the old queen into a new hive and gave her everything she needed. And then I left the, the big hive with a queen cell in there and they produced right. a, there was a queen that, that they produced i cannot find her i really just uh, don't know what to do <laughs> i really want to know where she is in case she swarms as well and then i yeah. think i've got bigger possibilities of spotting her if i need to correct collect her you know somewhere there are some ways that you can go about like making it easier to find the queen um i think ian was saying there's going to be a session on it so soon the basis right. removing some frames, making sure she's not on there, and then like kind of pairing up the frames in the box, so you're leaving yeah. big spaces mm -hmm. between them. And because Queen's going to want to be in the dark, she always runs yeah. towards the dark. Mm -hmm. She's going to be in between one of those frames. So if you maybe take out like say four, four frames, make sure mm -hmm. she's not on there. You can shake the bees back in. And then the hives that are remaining in that brood box, you put them together. Then there's a gap, another two frames together, a gap, another two frames together. Yeah, leave mm -hmm. them at that. Frame. Um, and the queen's going to be in between some of them, um, two of those groups. So it kind of narrows it down. Um, yeah. Have you got, I've got anyone who can give you a hand? Because two pairs of eyes, one, one, no, one, one, one. And, and to be honest, um, last year was the first full year as a beekeeper. And of mm. course, with the pandemic, I wasn't very alone. So mm. I literally just had to get mm -hmm. in there. And there was a scary moment where I thought they were swarming. But I couldn't understand that the you know they did look like they were swarming, um, but mm. that was the hive that didn't have a queen. So I thought, well, that can't be it then, you know. 
Um, but it turns out that other people had the same problem and basically the bees were too hot. So they started right. wanting to be outside. I like so, beard and they were hanging out outside the hive. Yeah, that as well. Right. So they were too hot. So I just, um, I was spraying water everywhere and um, mm. sort of, you know, giving them a mist and then, and stood with, <laughs> I stood with a brolly over the hive for a little bit as well, would you believe it? <laughs> just to cool them down. <laughs> You've got to things look you can get up to when there's a lockdown on anyway you know you've got loads of time on your hands <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah I, I mean they did calm down in the end but I just didn't know what to do and I've never actually I've never seen my bees swarm at all so I didn't really know what I was looking at I just I was looking at a lot of sort of movies on YouTube as well and is that mm. it so you know <laughs> it was quite scary and um, I was a bit worried that the neighbors might not like it as well. So that was my main worry actually. Um, mm. But I don't think they noticed. I think they were away some, you know, away. I hope they were. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'm keeping Maybe them sweet on my job. neighbors with, with um, honey because I did get to, um, I got I harvested twice last year. I got mm. nine kilos the first time and around nine kilo again the next time. So spring nice. and autumn. So it did, did really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Where I do you keep your bees? Like what, what, are you in Newcastle or Hexham or North Hexham. Tanksville? I'm in Hexham. Hexham. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't actually, I didn't take any honey the first year I had bees because I'd been told and I, 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 I kind of want to keep things natural and I don't want to rob the bees either. I kind of feel like, yeah. like you said yourself, that it's theirs to start with. So if I get mm. a little bit, that's just a bonus for me, but I did get loads, so I was quite pleased. Um, Dude, so, right then. yeah, and I, I, was, I was sure to share some with the neighbours just to keep them sweet as well. <laughs> you might not mind the stink if they've had a, a jar of honey. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, my, my husband got stung pretty badly last year. Um, he'd, um, we were actually rushing, having a, we had to do an inspection before we were going on holiday because we were concerned we were going to be away. Hi. So um, got in and were well, rushing things as I know you shouldn't do, uh, and we hadn't he hadn't closed his bee suit very well, and all of a sudden he says, uh, I, "I think I've got a bee, bee inside my suit here." I says, "No, you can't have you, you know, just nonsense." Uh, and they said, "Yes, I do." And then all of a sudden they just and then, yeah, I could see him going, "Ow, ow, ow!" Uh, and he got no. so, yeah, there was more than one, and he got stung about nine or ten times around his neck and his face. And he mm. looked like an elephant man on his whole holiday. <laughs> I was going to say, you're just going on a holiday as well, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> and we had but to again, swing by a metal centre to make sure we got lots of medicine for him. <laughs> so, Jeez, I bet you make sure his suit sealed every time now. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> That's the hard and we usually do, but we were rushing that day, so he hadn't done it and I hadn't checked. That's, I should have done that too, because we usually check each other, you know. Um, yeah. That the thing. But, and that yeah. first time you can be in your suit can be can be terrifying, can't it? Uh, yeah, um, he, I could tell him because he was panicking and he's usually extremely calm, more calm yeah. than myself. Um, and so when he said he got stung, because we, we were right in the middle of an inspection and it happened, I said to him, mm. right, just get out of here, out, go. Yeah. And he just went to the back garden and got his suit off and all that. But some of them were following him because I, I think they can smell it when you've been stung because you send out the pheromones, don't yeah. you? Sure. Uh, so that some mm. of them were following him, but he was it was pretty bad for him. Bless him. Well, uh, We've learned a lesson there. <laughs> it's a mistake we've all made. It really is. Um, yeah. 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 No. Has any of you lot been stung really badly? I had a couple of colonies at one stage, um, which I ended up having to sort out, um, which <laughs> were absolutely they they were beyond angry. Um, I used to kind of go into them with several layers mm. of clothing underneath the bee suit and a, and a hat on underneath the bee suit and really thick gloves and really thick gauntlets. And when I took the gauntlets off and uh, afterwards, there will be a hundred plus things in each gauntlet. Um, and in the end, oh. they, 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 I tried to, I tried to bring them right. I tried to requeen them and all the, all the other things, but they were just evil little buggers. Um, <laughs> so it, I mean, I keep a scale. I hope most of you keep records. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And mine's between one and 10 for temperament. 
That's the only time I've ever got to two. I've, I've saved one just in case I come across something worse. But it's, it's yeah, you don't want to be dealing with those on a regular basis. It's no fun at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions, anybody? Uh, where did you find that photo? Um, but apart from that, that was... Uh, no, that was <laughs> you know, good... Good few years I wasn't doing. exactly. I wasn't exactly spoke for choice though. <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking for, I was like, I can't put this on the internet. Sure. <laughs> that was um. That was, I don't know if you remember. That was Bun's wedding. Um, that's the most. That's obviously that's honestly the most public photo that I'd be able to share. Like the most safe photo. <laughs> uh, but no time. Everyone stuff. else wants to see the more photos of James at him. Um, <laughs> him next week. <laughs> yeah. But no top stuff. Now it's been a, it's been a fresh. Now it's been cash. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dougie. Uh, it's it's really nice of you to kind of offer to do this <laughs> and, and and sort of to give people really kind of an honest, open, and kind of clear of, of how well you're doing, how well you're taking to it. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, to hear yeah. You again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and if, as well as being able to tell me story, I just do hope that some of me enthusiasm does kind of rub off on anybody thinking about keeping bees. And um, if you're thinking about keeping bees, do it, like go and do it. Um, you'll, you'll not regret it. it it's class. <laughs> Loads of fun. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, any, yes, uh, Ian and Sue, I can see you've raised your hand. Uh, have you got a question? Unmute yourself. I think they were just saying. It was a clapping hand. So oh, it was a clapping hand. Oh, Thank you, pardon. Right, really right, cheers. Sorry. But I was just saying thanks to Dougie for a good session. Thanks. We enjoyed it. Terrific. Um, great to hear. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dougie. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming along uh, this evening. Uh, we're back uh, second Tuesday of next month, which is two seconds, and I'll tell you what date that is. Uh, we're back on the 11th of May, and we'll be talking about swarm control with a lovely lady from the BBK called Diane Drinkwater, who is, a, as well as working for the BBK, she... Um, runs a bee chat kind of uh, thing on Facebook um, and she's genuinely just an incredibly nice person uh, her talks and things are always are always excellent and swarm control I know it's a topic that can stress people out um, it can be dealt with there's prevention and there's control have a little read about it um, have a little look at some of our YouTube videos about it and and we'll kind of actually bring it, bring it back as a proper topic um, hopefully just before it happens um, because the end of end of uh, May is often a classic time when it kicks off so uh, hopefully that'll be useful to you thanks everybody um, Dougie I'll leave so you to, to you. Uh, hold off the record to cut the recording when you're ready and to uh, and to close the meeting thank you thank smashing you. yes Honestly, thanks so much, guys, for sitting and listening to us and um, waffling on about bees. Not many people would sit and listen to us for that long. Um, hope to meet you soon in association. Look after each other. Look after your bees. Peace. <laughs>